All right, how are we doing, everybody? Uh, I'm going to show you how I like to service and oil a clock. <clears throat> this is a, a standard Hermley chain drive. Uh, Hermley's like saying Chevrolet. There's a lot of them. And this one's pretty dirty, and it's really worn out. This will not be used anymore, and somebody rebuilt this along the way. And they also cleaned it with an ammoniated cleaner, uh, which I don't personally do, that I don't do um, because it discolors the brass and it can uh, and it cuts the lacquer it um, strips the old lacquer off and that can get down into the pivot holes but anyway um, there will be a lot of these movements out there and if you want to oil up your own movement and service it you know give it a, a light cleaning I will show you how to do that um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna dig out these pivot holes with a toothpick and get whatever bits of old oil, you know, built up gunk. Uh, oil dries, and if you use a really good oil, it won't dry for, it won't even start drying for 10 years. And if you use a bad oil, um, you're good for a couple of years. See, that's just one pivot hole, and I've already got that much dirt out of it. And uh, I'm gonna go along here. I use a little piece of paper towel, and I'll get underneath where I can with my toothpick and my paper towel and I'm not going to end up getting all of the dirt out but that's okay uh, and, and the old oil there'll be a little bit of uh, residue left in there it's kind of like when your the oil gets changed in your car all they're doing is draining it, draining it out of the crankcase but the inside of the motor is not getting clean they're not running some kind of a cleaning product through your car engine after they've drained the oil to get the rest of the residue out it's just not necessary you get some fresh oil in there and and that'll get you going for a while now on a lot of the American clockmakers instruction manuals they will suggest cleaning and servicing your clock and oiling it every two years and they don't even put it up towards the front of the instruction manual it's kinda of hidden in the back and in many cases it's, it's on either the last page or the second to last page and and it's not easy to find so if you're a guy like me oh man I, I maybe I shouldn't even admit it but I don't use the instruction manual much of the time I'll plug something in and I'll start pushing buttons and I I'm just gonna figure it out so I it's not like I blame anybody for not reading the full set of instruction manuals from their clock see this is just part of the front and it's dirty so I'm gonna set him down I'm gonna get another piece of paper towel and I'm gonna do the same thing now somebody put a screw in bushing over here on this side and I don't like seeing or doing that either because that means they didn't polish the pivot now Hermley this movement right here isn't really a rebuildable movement anyway once this movement is done you really have to throw it out and start over or maybe you can use the gears for steampunk or something but uh, average lifespan of a Hermley movement is usually 25 to 30 years. I've seen him go close to 40, and I've seen him go as little as 17 or 18. And I say that um, that I've seen him because I've been doing house calls quite a long time. My father um, was in a wheelchair because of polio, and so even as a child, he would have me go on house calls with him, and I would help him up the stairs of the house and. And then I would take the weights and pendulum off of the clock and then the dial and hands and get the movement out of the clock and I'd hand it to him. And again, this is at an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old child doing that. So by the time I could drive at 16 years old, he had me doing house calls on my own. Um, so here I am at 16 years old going into customers' houses with a toolbox to work on their grandfather clock. And uh, I'm sure there were some sketchy calls early on. And I'd love to go back in time and see the faces of some of the customers as they realize that it's a 16-year-old kid that's there to service their clock. But all that being said, now that it's been 42 years later, I've, I've got that kind of experience where I've been just doing this a long time. See, here's another piece of paper towel, and it is absolutely filthy. And again, I'm not going to end up getting all of it out, but I'll get the bulk of it out. <clears throat> and again, i got to kind of go underneath some of these gears and then some of them we won't be able to get under it all like underneath the center shaft here I can't I can't get in there there's not enough room 
But we're going to get to some of that from the inside. Now, if you can't take your movement all the way out of the case, like I have done, let's say you're not comfortable with that, and maybe your clock doesn't need a full cleaning, you can come in from the side, and I'll show you in a minute how we're going to oil this up from the side if the clock is still inside of your case. But in the meantime, we're going to keep cleaning here. And going in here. And you can see that this thing's really getting dirty fast. And sometimes I'll work on a movement that looks perfectly clean until I start getting down into the pivot holes. And the pivot holes are these places in the movement where um, the pivot for the gear, or wheel if you want to call it, is coming through the plate. This whole section of brass, this is the brass plate. And there's two brass plates here, and, and then all the wheels ride between them. And um, so I won't clean much more on the inside right now while we're on tape, but you can go down with your toothpick on down in the inside also and work that little piece of paper towel around so that you can get where the pivots go through the plates on the inside because that too has the opportunity of getting kind of dirty. I know a chain fell off. There's only one chain left on but that can all be put on after the fact. This movement will actually never get used again. It is worn out and I just grabbed it off the shelf for the purpose of showing you how to service your clock and give it some fresh oil. And uh, the oil I'm going to use is oil that my father was experiment experimenting with a long time ago. And it was a surefire winner. Um, it's a blend that um, we use today and it has proven itself over 10 years to still have good lubrication qualities about it. So instead of two years as the manufacturers of grandfather clocks suggest, we suggest servicing every six to eight years. Now it's very often very common for me to go to a house call and the customer has never had it serviced and now the clock's stopping. Um, maybe the clock's 15 or 20 years old and uh, that's a sign that it has been running dry for a while and for it to start stopping it now might need some other attention. You know, it might have a worn pivot hole and need bushings or you know, certainly it's <clears throat> the pivot starts scarring once it runs dry. Now the pivot hole is, like I said, these where the, the the wheels come through, the pivots of these wheels come through the plate. And that's called an oil sink, the little section that's kind of sunk in there around, it's beveled in around the pivot. And when you rebuild a clock, it's usually because one of these wheels has worn in a certain direction and you need to put, you need to cut out a section of brass there and uh, push in a little brass bushing that has been fit properly for the pivot. This is a bushing right here. Somebody put a bushing in here. And uh, I got, I think I got in there pretty well to clean him out. Yeah, there's still a little bit of dirt in there or old oil. And uh, so if it does not have a bushing, it's called a pivot hole. And once it has a bushing like this would be a screw-in bushing, then it's a bushing. Okay, we're gonna go around to the back. Basically do the same thing. I can see some stuff that's so dirty, I'm not even gonna use the toothpick yet. I'm just gonna wipe it off. So already I'm getting some dirt off of this side. And I'll come in again with my toothpick. And I'll get underneath some of this stuff. And you can see how dirty some of that is. And I'm gonna do the same thing. Go around every single one of them. This side doesn't look quite so bad. Is the other side. This side's a little easier because I can get to all of the pivots. They're not covered up with as many detents and special features as the front is. The front controls most of the chiming and striking. And so you have more arms and levers to get in the way of making sure you get every pivot hole clean. And we'll get one here. 
Now I'm going to use Grandpa's clock oil, and uh, that's named after my father. My father's been gone four years now at 85. He lived a good life, and he started out working on clocks really young. I've got a note my grandmother wrote about 60 years ago saying that he had repaired his first alarm clock at five years old. I don't know what kind of a repair it was, but my son happens to have that same kind of a uh, general mechanical aptitude. I did not have that same level of aptitude, uh, but my son was taking stuff apart or fixing things at a very early age. And um, my favorite story of my son taking stuff apart was, I think it was third grade, uh, the principal of the school called me up and said, that my son had taken the water fountain in the hallway apart and that I needed to come down and put it back together. <clears throat> well, I went down there and I could not put it together without using tools and my son had taken it apart without using tools. So one side of me wanted to discipline him and the other side wanted to give him a high five. Uh, but this is a mechanical aptitude he had since he was little. So anyway, dad had a mechanical aptitude since he's little. But he also wanted to experiment to try to find better ways of doing things. And one of those ways was to experiment with oil. And I think he was about 19. Um, and that would have been 49 when he started heavy experimentations of oils. And my favorite story of all that is when my grandmother came home to find smoke in the house. And of course, anytime you walk in and find smoke in your house, it's a little alarming. Well, she goes into the kitchen to find my father at 19 years of age, or somewhere right in there, boiling four different oils on the stove to find out which one did better under heat for the electric clocks of the time. Electric clocks, you don't see them anymore, but these were clocks you plugged into the wall. And they could chime or strike or just tell time, um, but they were popular back then because you didn't have to wind them up and they would keep a really nice time. And but they would also produce heat. You know, the little motor in there could average maybe 140 degrees all day long, not not in a big area, but just right there where the motor was. And so you needed an oil that would do well under heat, you know, not dry out faster because it was warmed up. Now you can see it this thing that's mainly from the backside, that it's just filthy. And that's one, two, three, four, five of those. And this is this is clean enough for um, purposes of showing y'all how to service. And I could go in the inside a little bit better. Now I'm going to show you about oiling it. You really don't want too much oil. It's actually best to have too little oil than too much. And I'll show you why in just a second. But I'm going to go right along here. And I'm going to put a little tiny bit of oil in each one of these oil sinks. And I can see it coming out. And I can see it going into that little oil sink. And I've got a little too much oil in some of these spots. So I'm going to go back over and clean that oil out. Now where I can't see it, I'm going to come in there, sneak under there, and just... Give a little pressure on the oiler. So I believe this back side, let me make sure I got those, has been oiled. Now where I got a little too much oil, you know, I can just run over the face of this plate and it's not going to pull all the oil out. A lot of the oil that I want working has already wicked into um, the pivot. Now I'm going to show you from the side. Like, for example, you know, this center shaft here, I can't get to it from the front. So I'm going to sneak in here and oil it. And for those of you who don't want to take your clock movement out, you can sneak in and just get a little bit of oil right next to where the pivot goes into that brass plate. You do not want to oil the gear teeth. Clock gear teeth are designed to run dry. So that rules out spraying anything in here. But I don't know a spray that's going to last long term anyway. This oil here should last 10 years, no problem. And before it even starts drying. I wouldn't push it any farther than that, but you don't really need to. Okay, I think I got the back oil. And if you see something I didn't catch, um, that's a good reason to maybe go back over some stuff. That all looks oiled. This all looks oiled. Catch some of this stuff here. But you go into the middle, and I and I caught most of those here, and I can do the same thing. If you're coming in, oh, if you're coming in from the side, you just want to reach in there and get a little bit of oil on all the pivots, front and back. 
and that way you won't have to take your movement out if you are if that's a little much for you it's better to not worry about getting the clock clean and get some fresh oil than it is to simply not oil it at all as long as there's some lubrication there you will be extending the life of your clock so I think I got that entire side so over here the same thing you know I'll go to the other side of the clock if I'm not taking it out of the, the case and I'll come in and I'll get a little bit of oil where those pivots are going through the plates so I have basically oiled the, the entire back of the clock and I've been oiled the entire clock from the inside which I normally wouldn't do it I, I don't want to oil it from I usually take it out and I'm oiling it from the front and the back but I wanted to show you how you could oil it if you just wanted to leave it leave the movement in the case so I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna oil all these little places going right up the drivetrain here and again I put a little too much on a couple of these so I will go back through and wipe that off again I can't get the center shaft I'm going kind of fast because the oil's coming out at a nice pace and I don't want to uh, get too much oil in there. Get some of this stuff out of the way. He looks good. Okay, so I'm going to take another little paper towel in a couple places. I got a little too much oil. And again, I'm not I'm not taking all the oil out. I'm just getting what's on the surface. And the reason you want to get you don't want too much oil, and I'll show you why. Let's say I've put too much oil on here, and you can see that the oil is now running down. Well, that's actually created a pathway for all the oil to be pulled on out with gravity. <clears throat> and I've made a little bit of a river there. Now that river is going to make it easy for almost all the oil to come out of that pivot. It'll just be drawing, gravity will be pulling it all down. So you, that's why you don't want to put too much oil in there. You don't want it wicking out of the pivot hole. So there you have it. That's a chain drive Hermley cleaned and oiled and you can see that there was a lot of dirt and uh, please catch my next video when I'm oiling up some different kinds of clocks that either have a balance wheel or mainsprings. Thank you.